All right, saludos, mi gente. Saludos, estamos aquí, estamos presentes. Yes, y'all, and hey, there's going to be a lot of bilingual talk. If you don't like it, get out. All right, we here now. We repping, we repping hard. This is our classroom, and we welcome all types of diversity, including language diversity. So you're going to feel that today because I have Las Doctoras, the dynamic, the awesome, the heavy hitters, Doctora Carla España y Doctora Luz Yadira Herrera. Bienvenidos. Gracias por esa introducción. I love that way of presenting us. We need that all the time. I love that energy. Es un placer estar aquí. Y siempre en esta plataforma y en el trabajo que ustedes hacen. So, thanks for the invitation. Igual, igual. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Gracias a ustedes. Uh, so, today we're going to be talking about exploring language, identity, and power with poetry. Ooh, I'm excited to hear from y'all and to learn from y'all in our classroom. So, hey, let's go ahead and dig in. The two of you are the authors of En Comunidad. Let me flash this bad boy real quick. En Comunidad. <laughs> Lessons for Centering the Voices and Experience of Bilingual Latinx Students. This text is rich. And we're going to get into some of the content, but let's start with the cover, which was designed by Natalie, or Natalie, I don't know how she pronounces it. Yeah, Natalie. Natalie, okay. Natalie G. Cruz. And the, my, my question is, what do you find poetic about the book cover? Because it's, it really draws me in. And I, I was wrestling, I was just thinking, you know, when I was drafting my questions, I'm like, Man, I got to say something about this book cover because it's beautiful. It's dope. Like the colors, um, the 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 physical character, uh, characteristics, right? So there's representation there. You know, I feel the like affirmation and whatnot. Um, over here, when I, when I look at this design, it seems like the wing of a butterfly to me. There, there's a lot going on. You got the flowers and whatnot, some flowers. Th this is beautiful. This cover is beautiful. Y'all have a beautiful work. The text is amazing. This is so resourceful. Like, I'm like, yo, I'm gonna have to go back into full-time classroom teacher mode just, you know, to be able to use this and, and, and collect some data. But let's let's talk about this book cover. What do you find poetic about this book cover? I'm so happy you're shouting out the illustrator, Natalie G. Cruz, as mi cuñada. So my sister-in-law, um, I, I love her work. I appreciate her um, listening to the goals that we had with this book. And I'll talk about the flowers. And I know Luz can talk about the the, the butterfly in it. Um, but for us, it was important to consider the legacy, um, our ancestors, those that like shoulders, which we stand upon and those who've come before us. And we think a lot about the practice of honoring those who've come before us. And um, the sunflower is a way that I honor um, one of my tias who passed away when she was very young and who's been a central figure in my life. Um, and we were also thinking about the flowers that we use on our altars in, in honoring um, those who have passed away. Um, and so we wanted to have that representation as something that was um, honoring the past, but also a way of celebration. So that for me is poetic, thinking about um, that process for us of, of honoring those who've come before. But Natalie's done a lot there with the with the image of the butterfly and what that represents and the child being there. And it wasn't like us, but it was the child. So I know, Luz, Luz you want to talk about that? And um, well, we had a couple of concepts that we, that Natalie sketched out for us. And we picked that one because it was just really about centering the child, right? Like the the child in that cover is is who we want to center in our work, the children, our kids. Um, and of course, the butterfly has a has a deep significance in, in our in Latinx culture. I think in general, just the the meaning behind like the butterfly and its representation um, with migration, right? Um, and also changing or just uh, you know evolving in the dyna the, the dynamicism of it all. Um, and so we wanted to capture that in the cover. Natalie certainly did. This certainly did. This is this is just a beautiful work. And uh, so I appreciate the thoughtfulness behind that and all, all the connections that inspired this cover. 
uh, it's you know this is the first thing that people look at right so you you have to have something that draws the reader in so props to the three of you for that all right so so you you know i, I was looking at chapter six so i was you know i was jumping around the, the whole book and I, I struggled to come up with some questions because there was just so many topics that we could get into and the layout was so uh, efficient. And I was just like, I don't even know what to ask because this is pretty much like you could just open it and just start applying, right? Read and apply, read and apply. Um, I love that you went with chapter six so that the poetry one. <laughs> yes, yes. I was like, I had a moment when I was like, oh, wait boom light bulb went off like this <laughs> i have to talk about this because it, it's it's in my wheelhouse too and so you you have this amazing list of poets and poems and text sets um great that you're offering these resources and it's listed in chapter six of the book and we're focusing on chapter six if you could expand that list who and what would you add because i would imagine that there were probably folks that got left out or certain titles that got left out is like yo you could only have so much all right you can't have a whole chapter uh, of just listing poets and in poems and text sets but if you had the opportunity to add on who who would you add on what would you add on i'll start with my you want to go loose are you already okay Um, yeah go ahead and then i'll say something about how we wrote chapter six without including any real poetry in there because we couldn't really. So I'll talk about that, but go ahead, Carla. So for me, my latest poetry read, and I've been reading it with all my students at Brooklyn College this fall semester, is um, Elizabeth Velasquez, Y Si Lo Logramos, um, Una Historia um, New Yorican in English is When We Make It, When We Make It. Um, and it's because I'm based in Brooklyn, teaching in Brooklyn, um, the author's local Brooklyn, and the the way that Elizabeth uses language and talks about issues like gentrification, trauma, family, um, intergenerational trauma. Um, I It has caused us to have such deep conversations with my students who are pre-service teachers, um, and as well as undergrads who are considering education, and they've all been processing like, wow, this is deep. And this poet in this in novel, YA novel in verse is helping us um, think about those topics. So for me, I think I would like to expand with more of um, this latest work because that's the one I've been digging in. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we have a copy of that here. Yeah, of course. And I mean, th- that just came out this year, right? So we have so much, we're so fortunate to be in a time where we have this rich, children's literature, this rich rich, uh, YA middle grade literature, right? And so I feel like even between the time that we were writing in Comunidad and now there's so much that's been published and we're so thankful for that because now we can write like um, They Call Her Fregona, the the sequel, um, David Bowles by David Bowles, right? Like we are so excited to be able to to continue or expand our work um, now that we're working with districts and schools just across the nation and be able to share these latest works with them. So it's not, it didn't make it to the book, right? Because of when it was published, but we're so fortunate to be able to share um, in many other ways or capacities. And if I could also add, because since I we published the book, I taught sixth and seventh, I taught seventh and eighth grade English. And with my seventh and eighth graders, we listened to the Poetry Unbound podcast. Mm-hmm. And the Poetry Unbound podcast gave us a nice format as a um, as a model for the uh, my middle school students to create their own poetry podcast. And we listened to poems um, in that in that podcast that were like transformative for them as middle school students. So I would want to bring them in. <laughs> so I would go to my poetry about and we had um, Andres Serpa poem there. Um, we had a lot of poems that helped them consider not only their their position as middle grade students, but also how they relate to poetry at them, themselves as, as writers, as readers. Um, so I'd love to bring that in and doing some work around um, writing the script for your own poetry podcast to talk about poems that you either write yourself or that you're kind of interpreting that other poets have written. I'm elated to hear that you're doing this work with the students. It's so important, so necessary. So I, I want to do something different. And and this idea was inspired by your recommendation on, on page 153. All right. <laughs> All right with the citations. All right, look at hey, you. Hey, hey, you know, we did, you did the reading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do my homework around here. 
You know, we're, we're, we're not just inviting folks to shooting from the hip. You know, we, we, we're digging in, we're learning, growing and giving props with props to do. And, and this is such a good text. I'm like, yeah, I, I really got to draw from this. Uh, so I, I want to use the guiding questions you offer to facilitate group discussion uh, amongst us, right? And and you offered in the book to facilitate group discussions with students who have read poems in their set. And so I don't have a set of poems, but I do want to read my poem, Café con Leche, um, or I want us to read it from my upcoming book, Blueing Tears. And then I want to ask you the guiding questions. And as you stated in your book, the discussion can address both the content of the poem with this focus on matters relating to bilingual identities and what the poem makes you feel, think, see, and consider. And so we're going to model this for the teachers, all right? So those of you who don't have en comunidad, or maybe you haven't and you haven't actually started applying some of this rich content, we're going to model it for you today. And I'm excited to do so. Trust me, I was thinking about this. I'm like, how can I how can we do something different? I don't want to ask you the questions that everybody else is asking you when you come on their podcast or whatnot. And that's, you know, props to everybody who's bringing you on and asking you the, the same questions, but I want to do something different. All right. So uh, we're going to, we're going to do this. Um, so Gala, you're going to have stances one, three, five, seven, and nine. And Lucio have stances two, four, six, and eight of Café con Leche. And then I will ask us the guiding questions. Sounds good. All right, let's do this. I've, I've never uh, done an activity like this where the poet is right here and I'm reading the poem in front of the poet. Like this is mad intimidating, but I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try. <laughs> now you got this. Café con leche. Ah, the taste of café con leche blends of coffee and milk. Island fresh beans imported to the States, mixed to form one from two. Old traditions held firm, introduced to customs anew. Azúcar melts into the coffee and milk. A compromise, a sweet flavor. The, des the deliciousness of both sides, but... The café cannot assimilate to the point of only being leche. It loses its essence. Sabor, bebiendo espacio. Heritage in each drink. De café con leche. Ooh, that was a dramatic pause. <laughs> <laughs> Muy bien, muy bien, gracias. You know, it's funny, Luz, I just shot a video for this last Friday, and I had to do like seven takes on that one line, the deliciousness. Okay. Or like, I don't know, it's something about us who speak Spanish and then like trying to say a word like deliciousness. <laughs> it's because you, you're trying to say delicioso. It looks like so close. And you're like, I just want to say delicioso. Maybe your heart is like, I want to say, it's tan delicioso. <laughs> I don't say that often on my in my daily life, but I'm gonna have to now to listen. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, let's uh, yeah, let's work through these questions now. Oh, thank you for reading that. It sounded so good. I might have to ask y'all to like do the audio book for doing <laughs> tis. Um, Yo, so, that's my dream. That's on my list. I would love to do audio books. I'm putting it out there. You, you I want to do, do audio books. You can do it. You know, you 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 got that. You got the New York voice. You know, I, I think. I think it'll work for you. <laughs> um, so what parts of the poem stand out for you and why? And by the way, like this doesn't have to be that you each answer every question. I I can start. So I like uh, the part that stands out to me is the part where it says, uh, cafe cannot assimilate to the point of only being leche. It loses its essence. So something about assimilation and losing of our essence is standing out to me right here. How does the poem make you feel? There's for me, there's a sense of nostalgia, like remembering of um, 
for me the the my the own sense and and what I associate with my move from Chile to the states and for me it wasn't cafe con leche it was tecitos it was like te con leche um drinking tea is like a big thing in my Chilean family um and so it for me it just made me feel like nostalgia like this this longing this yearning for um remembering this memory of my childhood and the transition between one place and another um and again there's this this feeling of like joy but there's also this feeling of um i don't want to say like a bittersweet but it's this feeling of um longing longing for that past that i i um I'm associating with this poem with my tecito, pero también maybe it's because my parents today, they just landed in Chile and I haven't been there in years. So I'm kind of in my feelings today and I'm wearing, wait, wait, I'm wearing my shirt that says Chile. Uh... <laughs> so, so reading this poem, which is like very timely for me. So it's also this feeling of, have I lost something by being raised here as an immigrant? And what am I holding on to so I don't miss out on the essence of what it means to be Chilena, pero también criada en Nueva York, you know? Um, so all my life I've been like battling with this question and this this poem hit me right there. I was like, yes. Wow, wow. Yeah. Man, <laughs> thanks for sharing. That brought out a lot. Ooh, that's beautiful. A nice shirt, by the way. Um. <laughs> <laughs> What's also because it's World Cup season and Chile didn't make the World Cup. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to cheer for Morocco, you know? <laughs> Yo, it's all good. Don't worry about it. Republica Dominicana didn't make the World Cup either. <laughs> so we we all we all cheer for Morocco now. <laughs> um, how did the poet use language, English, Spanish, word choice, to develop their ideas or make you feel a certain way? Hmm. I mean, of course, I love the translanguaging in this poem. Um, we, we talk a lot about translanguaging in our work and how it's so important to create these spaces where we um, can invite our students, right, to show up as their full selves, to bring all of their linguistic practices into, into, into our classrooms, into our any, you know, spaces. And so I think that when I, when I think about it as a teacher lens, I want to ask, you know, I want to be, be able to tap into the author's perspective like why why azúcar why sabor why those words um and I think it was it was very strategic right it was very uh intentional and I just you know I, I'm always curious about those um those decisions you'll have an opportunity to ask the author right now the author's holding back <laughs> I know. I know. Well, there you go. Why did you choose Sasuka? Why did you choose Sasuka? No, 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 no. I'm holding back for the moment. We're going to circle back. I want to I want to get through these questions and hear from y'all. And then I'm going to give you the floor to ask me whatever you want to ask me. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. All right. Uh, so how do the poet's experiences compare with your own life? Hmm. Yeah, I feel like I talked a little bit about that in my response earlier. So yes. I'll leave it to you, Luz. I think that what I hear, what I feel, what I hear, what comes through in this poem is, and I don't really, I don't really know the full story, right? So I'm just going by what I see here. And I don't really know your full story, but um, I see a lot of similarities in terms of just the experience. And Carla mentioned this already, right? The experience that we have when we belong to different places or to several places, right? Um, and our our constant effort to seek that, which is our reminders from home and feel like home and feel like we belong. And um, you know, the the old traditions piece right here with mixing or you know, introducing to the new traditions or new customs, like that's always our that's basically the the history of all of us right thinking about how we hold on to those old traditions that are important to our families that make us who we are but also thinking about new ways of being that can also just enrich our lives and enrich our futures and our you know our the future generations while while giving homage to our ancestors our past yeah there's there's a lot there's so much going on there um how what did you learn from this poem 
there's such a sense of that comes across for me the sense of like here I am like estoy aquí like I'm taking up space I am proud I am not going to lose my essence I'm bringing in from um, traditions from where I'm coming from. Um, and so using the cafe con leche as a way to, it's basically for me, it's like commentary on the diaspora, right? Uh, commentary on those who've had to leave home and talking about that through the cafe con leche. Um, and and just for each piece, it's it, it, it's kind of a little nudge for the, those of us who, who continue living in this tension. Um, and what does that mean to not lose your essence? What does it mean to, um, to, cuando dice sabor, bebiendo despacio, like to savor this uh, new identity that I have been forming in this new place. Um, and, and the way you end with heritage in each drink, de café con leche. I love that it ends in Spanish. I love that it ends with the title. Um, and and it's like remaining uh, rooted to that and not forgetting your roots. Um, so for me, like thinking about teaching this poem, I, I learned that I can provide students an opportunity to talk about their feelings about movement or about how do they feel about their identities, whether it's as immigrants or as um, forming an identity that's um, tied to geography or, or movement. Um, or and, and then just and taking that, like I see the parallels in a T-chart, like write that out as a free response prompt and then say, is there anything in your life that um, you can describe it as, is there, there a food, is there a song, a custom that would help you talk about that tension um, as the poet did with Café con Leche. So I'm already thinking about the lessons, you know? <laughs> as a good teacher, like a good teacher, one step ahead, doing some planning. That's awesome. It, it, so what more do you want to learn after reading this poem? Hmm. I, I feel like I want to learn about how, how you, you know, the, how the poet, um, like the experiences that led to this, to this writing, how the poet, um, you know, sort of shares some of these ideas, um, and how maybe it, it shows up in other in other writing and in other poems as well. That's what I would be interested in in learning about. So I'm thinking about like the tuck set. You know, what's next? What comes with this? Y'all are, y'all are such teachers. I love it. I love it. Well, let's work backwards. I'll, I'll, I'll start first of all. Let me say thank you for participating in this this activity. Thank you for creating this. Right for coming up with these guiding questions. When I was looking at this, I'm like, yo. Teachers got no excuse. Teachers got no excuses. Y'all laid it out. This is just like open up, read, do. <laughs> and and this often what teachers are asking for, right? Like, hey, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do. Well, here you go. You have a resource that a- allows you to just take in the information and then literally execute. You know, do what you have in front of you. And so, I've really appreciate the thoughtfulness that y'all put into crafting each chapter and providing these concrete examples, um, offering text sets, the the whole nine, such a beautiful design. Um, As as to the, the, the questions you have, and we'll start with the last one. Sorry, reiterate it. (laughs) So the experiences that led you to... Ah, that's what it was. Write this one, yeah. Yeah, that's what it was. And then you said something about, Luce, you had said something about, you know, if there are other pieces that connect with that. I think that's what you said. Yeah, they're like other texts. Like if you if you were to pair this poem with a video, a song, it would be your song that would accompany this poem. And also the, the intentionality, like why did you choose to, um, the, you know, the strategy behind like in terms why you chose azúcar and like sabor and bebiendo, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's great. So I wrote this years ago. I I don't remember exactly when. And it's been through different versions, right? But even through the different versions, like the essence has remained the same. This represents my reality in terms of 
being bilingual, bicultural, growing up here. Like I was born and raised in the United States, but I grew up in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And Lawrence has the highest population of Dominicans outside of New York City. And so Lawrence is very much unique because you're talking about like, this is high concentration of Dominicans within seven square miles, a hundred thousand people, seven square miles living in triple deckers, housing projects. And so we are very connected. And, you know, what you see in Lawrence is, is, you know, Santo Domingo bakery, eh, La Cibaeña, you know, a, eh, they renamed Broadway Duarte. You know, like <laughs> Lawrence is like the Dominican presence, Dominican culture is very much present there. And then I, I would also go to Dominican Republic periodically with my family. And even, you know, when I was old enough to go on my own, then I would go on my own. Like it was important to me to maintain that sense of connection, continue to learn about that aspect of my identity, my culture, my heritage while also navigating all of this here and then feeling like I was never fully in one or the other, you know, and we, we could get so deep into the why, right. You know, and I don't know if we'll have enough space and time, but I say like, you know, colorism is a big piece of that. Uh, you know, and unfortunately that's definitely impacted like, um, how I feel sometimes about my people, how I feel about my culture, like because of the way some people feel about me, just based on what they see, based on my skin color, based on my flow. It's like, then you get into the whole, oh, you know, like, me ven como americano. Yeah, uh, but, you know, there's, there's this thing about, you know, being black, right? We know amongst Dominican, you know, like there's, there's, there's this thing uh, as it relates to blackness and black denial um, that is very real. And it's something like, I continually to this day, like I got, I got, I got so many stories of stuff that just comes up like unprovoked. And I'm just like sitting at the YMCA and, you know, parent next to me and we engage in conversation. I'm like, Oh, do it. Oh, and you know, and we're talking and they're like, Oh, you know, you know, I didn't know you're Dominican. You don't look Dominican. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> and where does that come from? And what makes you think you look more Dominican than I do? Right. So, you know, so so part of it, like going back to a word that was used earlier is like I've always felt this tension, which is why I never I never fully felt and still don't feel like I'm fully cafe, but I'm definitely not fully leche. Right. I'm, I'm like, I'm not I'm not like, yo, I'm like 100% Dominicano, but I'm also not like 100% Americano. I'm like, I'm I'm this beautiful blend and mm -hmm. and azúcar allows that you know it, it brings it brings both together um well the way i use it is that it, it brings both together it, it brings the cafe and leche together and it adds this sweetness because like i'm rich in who i am and i'm confident in my identity um you know no matter what group accepts or doesn't accept me like i understand that i'm this and this is beautiful and so sugar's not the healthiest for you but it is beautiful <laughs> <laughs> and it tastes great. So that that's part of where I was going with 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 that with that azúcar and you know understanding like in the midst of you know compromising aspects of identity, like you could see that as bad, but you know for me it's only bad if like there's this full compromise, mm -hmm. as opposed to this beautiful balance. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Man, I need I need this for all the poems we read, right? I want like a little, <laughs> I want my little time with all the poets that we read. Poets note. Poets note. <laughs> yeah, and, and and then the other aspect of the question I want to answer is in terms of like other pieces that are connected. I have another piece titled Lengua um, in that same section. And that deals with my language identity. And and sometimes not only what's going on in my head, but you know what's what's happening in real time in terms of like, I I I know what this word means, but it's not coming out the way it's supposed to, you know. And and I'm not executing my Spanish the you know the way it needs to be 
executed, um, which, you know, then then sometimes makes me hesitant to like, depending on who I'm with, right? And like how I feel they might judge me, then it might meet me hesitant in terms of, you know, how much I'm using the Spanish or not using the Spanish. Um, and then in, you know, different circles, then it's more like a Spanglish thing, you know? Um, so there, there there is some segue there. And then there is another piece titled Spanish. Very, It's a haiku. And then it, that addresses a different type of tension, which is the tension I feel in terms of like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm holding on to this thing. And like, why is it so important for me to hold on to this thing? And like, oh, wait, but, you know, this also derived from colonization. Uh, so then there's that tension, you know, and, and you'll when you read the book, you'll. It, it comes together in in a in a wonderful way um, where, you know, I'm, I'm wrestling with the realities of this tension, you know, while also embracing the beautiful aspects of it all. I can also say that in, in the um, chapter six, we give the framework for teaching poetry through a healing, teaching, healing and resistance. And so we, we, we recommend for teachers to consider like, what is the poem teaching us about a certain topic? And what is the poem um, resisting? Is there a certain dominant narrative that is being resisted? And then also what is the poem healing or how is the poem an example of healing or a process that we can engage in healing? And I feel like what you just described with those different poems that you um, shared with us uh, definitely fit in to like how I can teach with that framework. Okay. Yeah. And to add to your earlier question, I, you know, we need to add, uh, we need some of your work now so that we can share it, you know, <laughs> model it for teachers in our workshops and in our future writing. So thank you for, thank you for putting that in, into the world. When is that coming out? End of January. End of January. Oh, okay. 23. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming and really excited I think that the the work that y'all do and, and, and the work that um, Lorena and I do as multicultural classroom, that there's there's a lot of alignment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we we bring a lot of our bilingual, bicultural experience in, in, into our work, and that's going to definitely be reflected in the book. And uh, again, even just... Uh, I, like I said earlier, I had trouble focusing on like what questions to ask y'all because I'm like, man, there's so many things that we could talk about. Even the section you just mentioned, I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna base my interview on this. Um, but then I, you know, I'm reading some other stuff and I'm looking at the 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 poets that you picked and the poems that you picked. And I'm like, wait, they picked some of my favorites, <laughs> like <laughs> Langston Hughes and and Tupac Shakur, Rosette grew from concrete, like. That even when you look at my book cover, like, and this wasn't a conscious thing, you know, but after somebody had pointed it out to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, my book cover mm -hmm. has some parallels with Tupac's book cover for The Rose That Grew From Concrete. Um, and again, it wasn't like, you know, I th that's what I was going for. That's just what came. But when you're inspired by, you know, all these wonderful people, some that the stuff would just come out naturally. I hear that. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. So talking about inspiration, if you had the opportunity to have lunch with any poet, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Carla, tu primero. Uh, this is a hard one for me. But... So, I mean, I can think of like a dinner party. I want to party with like, you know, 20, 30 poets because this is what... I every day I'm like reading and engaging with poems and poets so there's so many but I think right now just thinking about the moment where I am in my life now as an educator and and the poet that I've been engaging um, and my students have been engaging and I'm looking forward to over the break to read one of their books is um, Safia El Hello who's a Sudanese uh, poet based in uh, DC and um, Home is Not a Country. Their YA novel in verse is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, I, I showed her Ted um, animated poem uh, um, to what was it, my seventh and eighth graders um, and just 
I, I just think like I would love to to talk about their to get to know like the process to get to know also their experiences that have shaped their poems. Um, so the book that I'm planning on reading over the break is is it Girls That Never Die? That's the new one that that um, yeah, Girls That Never Die. Um, so that's who I would love to have lunch with just at this moment because that's who I've been like engaging with. No, that's what about great. you? That's great. How about you, Luz? Oh my God. Okay, I have like. Lou, sometimes people be stressed when I ask this question. <laughs> no, and then also, awesome. like, we obviously, like, have to, you know, celebrate your book and have lunch with you. So that's going to happen at the next conference. Like, I'm I like, oh, we're going to see you. But in our, like, you know, dream world, those who we, we don't cross paths with, who would it be? <laughs> yes, yes. So when you said somebody that's dead or alive, I was thinking about, I picked one of each, one, one who is, you know, long gone. So... Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. I would love to, <laughs> to have lunch with her, to spend time with her. I mean, I remember reading about her like from college and like, I was just such an awe about like, just the way that she, she's way, she was way ahead of her time. I mean, of course, you know, she is like perhaps one of our very first um, more, more notable feminists. Um, and I just, you know, the way that she's, you know, basically pursued, became a nun because she wants to be able to study and just like that intellectualism, like that's just such a draw for me. And so I just, I would love to be able to have that conversation with her about just everything about um, her experiences growing up in that time in Mexico. And, and so I would, I would pick her, which is like a really strange choice, but yeah, I think that somehow like I'm, I've always been drawn to her. I don't see it as strange. I totally see. I'm like, oh yeah, I can see Luz having like lunch with Sor Juan Inez. Like that totally makes sense to me, Luz. I even looked up. I'm like, is she a Gemini? She has to be a Gemini, but she's not. It's incredible. (laughs) (laughs) It's great. I I love when folks mention individuals that have not been mentioned in previous interviews. And both of you did that today. So what is a message of encouragement that you want to offer our listeners? I think I'll start. Um, so, and I, I feel like I keep kind of chiming in on this every chance we get, a, every chance we get, but there's so much happening all of the time. Um, and specifically in education, right? We were struggling in the last couple of years so much with the banning of books and just like the limitations that we've been you know, that are imposed in certain states about how teachers can teach things like history, right? And so I just want to, I don't know, I just want to just acknowledge that struggle. And um, we we spoke about it in several sessions at NCTE uh, with several authors and educators, and everybody, you know, is sort of grappling with that right now. So I just kind of want to say that, um, you know, we I'm just really happy to be able to be in a time and a place where we can have many different platforms to share um, and be able to access the books that we can and and hopefully figure out ways to to um, remove all of these kinds of like, you know, barriers to accessing the books that our children need in our classrooms everywhere. Yeah, that's real. That's real. Thank you. Good luck. I think for me, I've been thinking a lot because I made the t- transition from teaching um, middle grade last year and I was teaching higher ed grad school before that, um, before that was middle school. So I've gone like middle school adults and I'm back to undergrad now with adults. Um, and I think in this transition, what I've been thinking a lot about is how um, my work is sustainable. Like I can continue in this fight because I feel nurtured by the communities I engage with. And so if you hit a point that you're not feeling nurtured, maybe whether it's because if it's a toxic work environment or it's the people around you are not nurturing you, I think it's like um, finding support in and making sure you are in a supportive teaching environment or finding communities where whether it is at conferences that we connect with poets like you, you know, or I have weekly stand in Zoom writing sessions with Luce and I get to like bounce off of ideas and, and work together. So um, we need that for this to be sustainable. We're not this. These are not easy times to be an educator. And so. I, I really want to send that message of encouragement that you should not feel like 
Um, I'm going to do this on my own because you you can't um, and trying to find the places and people that will nurture you. Essential, essential. Thank you both. Thank you both. Where can folks follow you? You can find us on Instagram at um, En Comunidad Collective. And we're also on Twitter. I'm at DRA underscore Luz Jadira. And I'm at Profesora España. And again, make sure you support their work. Get a copy of En Comunidad, Lessons for Centering the Voices and Experience of Bilingual Latinx Students. Amazing text by the dynamic doctoras. Gracias. Eh, Gracias a ti. Es un placer. It's an honor to have read your poem. So thank you for giving us that like preview and to try out the activity because that's what this is about, right? It's living, it's living the work. So appreciate your take on this. Thank well, you. we will have to get together again, whether it's at a conference, uh, for for coffee and 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 connecting and, and sharing poetry or uh, back on the platform to get into another chapter of your book. Um, but keep up the amazing work. I'm certainly encouraged by it. So if you haven't heard that today, you did now. Peace Thanks. be with you. Gracias. Ciao.